audio is great to okay, me. Perfect. Thumbs up. Awesome. Yay. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much, Meredith, for the, for this invitation to speak. And of thank course, you. thank you all for waiting for me <laughs> to actually come <laughs> and speak with you this evening. Um, yeah. So once again, I don't know uh, what Meredith was talking about <laughs> during my little tech uh, problem, but basically the title of my talk today is what does an anti-racist pronunciation teacher do? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk for about maybe 30 minutes or it might be a little bit less, right? Depending on how much time we have, and then I can open up, open it up for a Q and A for you. Um, yeah. So once again, uh, my name is Vijay Ramjatan. Um, I am a PhD graduate from the University of Toronto. I'm, I'm currently on the academic job market, um, but I do have an affiliation with Brandeis University. So I'm a part of their um, language, culture, and justice hub. Um, yeah. So uh, before I officially begin, I just want to give a brief land acknowledgement. So I know land acknowledgements are kind of, um, you know, performative and superficial, but I'm, I'm using this land acknowledgement as basically a simple reminder that concerns about so-called foreign accents in such places as Canada, the U.S., are really a result of white settler colonialism that has led to the erasure and marginalization of indigenous languages and cultures. So what I really want to do with this reminder is really emphasize to you that uh, when we talk about foreign accents and those and foreign accents of racialized people in particular, um, these are not inherent problems in communication, but rather they're, they're made to be problems under certain socio-political contexts, such as white settler colonialism and other interlocking um, structures of oppression. Um, I also want to explain my title. So yeah, as you saw, the title of my, my talk is What Does an Anti-Racist Pronunciation Teacher Do? Um, and so the reason why I framed it as a question is because I don't really have the answer. So um, if you want to leave now, that's perfectly fine <laughs> with me. Um, but the reason why I framed it as a question is because, um, yeah, this is really an exploratory presentation. This is me sort of brainstorming and thinking out loud with all of you. Um, so I'm not giving this presentation as an expert, but someone who's, you know, trying to find some sort of answer. Um, yeah, with that said, I want to just give a brief... I think we're seeing, I think we might be seeing the other screen of your screen. We've got your slides like um, with the thumbnails on the left, if you wanted it oh, to no. be in full screen mode, but you may... I know we all have okay. like weird monitor situations, so it's like which screen is yeah. looking at which. <laughs> Okay, so I'm hey. in... Oops, hold on. Okay. Ooh, now it's oh, just me. No. And my floating head. Sorry for wearing a black shirt, everybody. I didn't... And it was, and I'm not... Okay, let I'm me try something different. Um, actually, let me open it up in... Let's see if this will work. Kevin also pointed out in the chat, if you all have the um, like speaker view, it may illuminate um, VJ's like name, but if you want to adjust that, you've got different views and you can pin different parts. So you should be able to see like screen share and then you can make the black boxes and all the faces smaller just by dragging that little middle piece um, to one direction or the other. Okay. Um... So we okay, see what you... sort of like your PowerPoint, like the looks like, yeah, like the Google Slides, but not in present mode. Okay, so let me press present, presenter, Yay. present from beginning. Okay, how's this? Perfect, love it. Okay, yeah, okay, this is like one of <laughs> everything that goes wrong goes wrong. Like literally, okay. a group of teachers. <laughs> <laughs> We're there every okay, day. So um, okay, yeah, so I'm going to, yeah, I talked about that. Yeah, so I don't have the answer uh, to the question. But yeah, having said that, I do want to give, um, do want to provide you all with somewhat of an answer, right? So I'm not wasting your time completely. So what does an anti-racist pronunciation teacher do? Um, an anti-racist pronunciation teacher, for me at least, quickly interrogates and challenges how race and racism shape perceptions and the teaching of pronunciation. Um, also, this teacher is committed to fighting against institutionalized racism associated with speech accent. 
Um, so what I'm going to do in this presentation is that I'm going to, you know, elaborate on that answer by talking about three priorities for an anti-racist pronunciation teacher. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to introduce a fairly well-known study um, that will sort of help us understand what types of priorities anti-racist pronunciation teachers need to focus on. And after I do that, I'll focus on each priority individually. So first, I'll talk about recognizing pronunciation as always embodied. Um, the second priority is about rethinking intelligibility altogether. And the, uh, the last priority is about fighting against institutionalized racism. And then to conclude, I'm just going to um, offer some additional priorities that anti-racist pronunciation teachers might want to think about in their own um, practice or future practice. Um, yeah, before I begin, I have even more warnings for you, sadly. Um, so just one thing that I want to point out is that I'm presentation as someone with a background in English language teaching. Um, so I know many of you are not teaching English. You're probably teaching other, you know, European colonial languages, for example. And with that said, I think a lot of the ideas that I am going to talk about today will apply to your own teaching context. So um, just keep that in mind. Also, um, although I'm interested in adult education and workplace learning, um, I'm not necessarily thinking of any particular context when articulating my ideas this evening. So um, yeah, I'm not saying that an anti-racist pronunciation pedagogy isn't applicable um, to your teaching context. I'm just not necessarily thinking about it at the moment. And then finally, um, as with practicing anti-racism in general, I'm not suggesting that there's one way to be an anti-racist pronunciation teacher. Um, yeah, so this is just me once again brainstorming ideas that I have. Um, but I'm not trying to be prescriptive in, in any of my ideas um, this evening. Okay, so um, with that said, uh, let's talk about a fairly famous study uh, conducted by Donald Rubin all the way back in 1992. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm curious if anyone knows about this study or has read this study before. And I can't see anybody at the moment, but um, in the chat, if you could just, yeah, tell me, ask each other or tell me. Each other, if you've yeah, seen, <laughs> seen that yeah, study. I don't, think I, I don't think I have either, I don't think. Okay, okay, well, no worries, because I will talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> I will explain it, yeah, the main findings for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what Ruben did, he, this is a really interesting study on how um, we can't always trust what we hear, right? So um, oftentimes when we talk about accents, we believe that we're, we, we automatically can trust our senses, but oftentimes our senses are fooling us in different ways. So what Ruben did in this experiment was that he had um, two groups of undergraduate students um, listen to a recorded lecture given by a so-called um, native speaker of American English. And so both groups of students heard the exact same lecture given by the exact same speaker, um, but the only difference between the groups was that the first group was made to believe that they were listening to a white woman give the lecture because they saw a white woman, um, they saw a picture of a white woman. Conversely, the second group um, believed that they saw that they were listening to an Asian woman speak because they saw a picture of an Asian woman while listening. So what was interesting um, about this study was that after both groups did a comprehension test of the lecture, um, the second group of students actually scored way lower than the first group, and furthermore, um, the second group believed that they were that they were hearing a so-called foreign accent coming from the Asian woman, which was perplexing because the Asian woman, um, you know, was also speaking with this so-called native speaker or native U.S. American accent. Um, so I think Ruben's experiment raises three important points uh, with regard to the topic of this presentation this evening. Um, so first, I think uh, when we talk about hearing speech accents, um, this often means that we're hearing racialized bodies at the same time, right? So with regard to the second group of students in Ruben's study, right, the reason why they might have perceived the Asian woman as foreign sounding is because they were actually perceiving the Asian woman's body and not the actual acoustic quality of her voice, right? So they were seeing an Asian woman and perhaps making stereotypical assumptions of what an Asian woman should sound like as an English speaker. Another thing to, uh, to think about is that intelligibility is not a straightforward concept. Um, yes, yeah, so oftentimes we think of intelligibility as this neutral objective construct, but as we saw with the Rubin study, 
even if you speak with a type of voice that's perceived to be intelligible, like a so-called native speaker um, accent or native speaker voice, right? This isn't always going to make you intelligible, right? Intelligibility might have more to do with what you like than what you actually sound like. And then finally, what are the material consequences of not being perceived as having an intelligible accent, right? So just imagine Rudy as a job interview for an English language teaching position. And if the Asian woman is not perceived as intelligible um, for maybe employers and students, right, is this going to affect her livelihood as a language teacher, right? Is she even able to find a job in the first place? Is she able to get a promotion and so on? So what I'm gonna do um, in this presentation is elaborate on each of these three points and frame them as different types of priorities for an anti-racist pronunciation teacher. So the first of these priorities is really recognizing um, pronunciation as always embodied. So for me, an anti-racist pronunciation teacher recognizes that perceptions of accents can't be divorced from perceptions of racialized bodies. Um, so when I make this point, I want to emphasize that bodies, especially racialized bodies, don't pre-exist, right? So I know this sounds kind of strange and you know out there, but from you know, a more of an academic perspective, we have to remember that we don't have naturally have bodies, right, in terms of race. Instead, our, our racialized bodies materialize through sensory encounters shaped by racist and colonial histories. So um, what happens is that in our everyday interactions with each other, when we perceive each other through our bodily senses, we're actually attaching, race is actually attached to our senses, right? So race acts as a sort of prosthetic attached to our sight, our, our vision, our vision, our hearing, our smell, and so on, right? And so we use this racial filter to sort of construct racial identities for each other. So what does this actually mean? So I know it kind of sounds, you know, kind of yeah, out there once again, but um, once again, just to explain it a little bit better, th let's think about the students in Ruben's study once again, right? So why did the second group of students perceive um, the Asian woman as foreign sounding, right? So one reason is maybe they were perhaps influenced by the historical and contemporary racialization of Asia North America. Um, so as many of us know, right, especially in Canada and the US, Asian people are often perceived or stereotyped as these perpetual foreigners, right, who are never born or raised in these countries. And as a result, they, they're perceived to be these, you know, so-called non-native speakers of English who speak English non-fluently in a, you know, in a so-called broken English, et cetera. So for Rubin's participants, right, maybe one reason why they perceived the Asian woman as foreign sounding was exactly of this perpetual foreigner stereotype, right? So through their, through seeing a, an Asian woman's body, right, they constructed the, what it means to sound, right, as this type of body. Um, so what does this have to do with teaching? So I think an anti-racist pronunciation teacher has to remember that no one enters the classroom disembodied, right? So in terms of teaching, I think this type of teacher has to critically reflect on whether their lesson or curriculum planning, pronunciation advice, um, choice of materials, et cetera, might be based on hearing the ethno-racial background of students instead of their actual speech, right? So. Um, just imagine, for example, that I'm, I'm teaching an English pronunciation class and I have a bunch of, you know, Japanese students in my classroom. And because I see a lot of Japanese bodies in my classroom, I think to myself, oh, I know that Japanese students um, have the, allegedly have this problem with the L and R phonemes in English, you know, those L and R phonemes. Um, in the English language. And because of this, I'm going to base all of my lessons on practicing these phonemes. Right? But the problem here is that I'm basing my pedagogy on a stereotype of what I think Japanese and other East Asian people should sound like. Right? So am I actually paying attention to what my Japanese students can actually do in the English language in terms of pronunciation? Perhaps they can already clearly distinguish the from ra, right? So if they can do that, why am I wasting time re-practicing these two phonemes when I could be focusing on something more important right? in terms of enhancing their intelligibility? Uh, for example. Um, another thing to remember for anti-racist pronunciation teachers is that they really have to think about and address what they embody for students in terms of their own racial positioning 
um, in society, right? So when I think about the English language, for example, oftentimes the white native speaker of English is perceived as the ideal teacher of the language. And conversely, the non-white so-called non-native uh, speaker of English is perceived as this, you know, sort of inferior teacher, right? So in terms of pronunciation, um, are your students actually perceiving you as an expert or a non-expert simply because of your racial embodiment, right? So you want to think about how are you actually going to dispel this myth, right? Whether, whether it's in terms of you being a privileged teacher or a non-privileged teacher, what are you actually trying to do to disrupt these, you know, stereotypical uh, notions about yourself? Um, yeah, so I think another thing to remember about um, the importance of recognizing the embodied nature of pronunciation is also witness in the establishing of goals for our students, right? Um, so I think an anti-racist pronunciation teacher has to question the necessity of having racialized students engage in the physical labor of training their speech organs to produce unfamiliar sounds. So one way that we can sort of explain this point is to um, talk about this, you know, infamous uh, TH sound in English, right? Um, so that voiceless interdental sound that we have in the word uh, three, for example, the number three. Um, so as many of us know, this TH sound is a very tricky phoneme for many students to produce, right? So they don't have this sound in their first languages and it's very physically laborious for them to train their, their, their mouths, their speech organs to produce this sound. Um, another thing to remember is that um, this, this phoneme rarely, if ever, causes mispronunciation or miscommunication uh, when allegedly mispronounced, right? So for example, if I'm giving you my phone number and I say it's 555 tree 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 tree, um, you know from the context of my utterance that I'm referring to the number three and not to an actual tree, you know, a tree in nature, you know, like a plant tree. You know, I can't think of a coherent definition of tree at the moment, but you, you get my point. Um, yeah, so given that the TH sound is, is physically laborious for students to produce, and it also doesn't really interfere with communication, why are we forcing students to actually engage in this unnecessary labor, in this embodied labor, right? And so if it's not really for intelligibility, we really have to question whether it's about something more nefarious or insidious, right? Is it really about maybe making students fit into some sort of hegemonic norm in our society, right? So uh, if, you're, if our students are living in Canada and the US where this phoneme is, is prominent, is it really about sounding quote unquote Canadian or quote unquote American, right? So we really wanna think about what's the point of, 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 of teaching certain types of sounds, right? Are they actually necessary? Um, yeah, so speaking about intelligibility and stuff like that, um, this actually leads us to the second priority for an anti-racist pronunciation teacher, which is really rethinking this notion of intelligibility altogether. So I think when you talk to um, many pronunciation teachers today, right, I think like 99.9% .9 of them are going to say that, you know, when it comes to the goal of pronunciation teaching, it's really about intelligibility rather than so-called nativeness, right? So especially when we're talking about European colonial languages, nativeness often has, you know, a racist, you know, colonial connotation, right? It really means like speaking like a white person, right, to be frank. So while we might think of intelligibility as, you know, this neutral, you know, more ethical, you know, goal for students, um, I have, you know, some problems with intelligibility, right? So first of all, is intelligibility really easily definable, right? I'm not, I'm not always sure about that. And furthermore, is it inherently neutral, right? Is intelligibility any better than nativeness, right? When we come to define intelligibility. So that's something we also need to think about. So with that said, I think an anti-racist pronunciation teacher has to rethink intelligibility for the purpose of making it contextually relevant to students and resisting linguistic white supremacy at the same time. So um, if teachers, uh, so first of all, if teachers pur purport to promote intelligibility, yet are defining it in accordance with so-called native speaker norms, um, then intel intelligibility just becomes a euphemism for so-called nativeness in English or nativeness in any language, which often gets linked to um, quote sounding white, right? So 
if you're telling your students that you don't need to sound like a native speaker to be intelligible, yet you're basing all of your learning materials on, on, on you know, native speaker varieties from the US and UK, which are you know, these stereotypically white countries, you're still saying that intelligibility you know, is still a code word for sounding white, right? Mm. So I think um, one way that we can sort of get over or get past this, this issue is to really think about the question of who gets to decide what constitutes intelligibility. Um, so when we think about the pronunciation classroom in particular, we, we typically perceive it as teacher-centered, right? So the pronunciation teacher is the automatic authority um, in pronunciation. They know what's right and wrong with students' pronunciation. They know what, how to correct, so-called correct students' pronunciation. But if we really are committed to having learner-centered classrooms, why can't we also do this in the pronunciation classroom, right? So this might mean letting students, you know, define what they mean by intelligibility, right? Let them define intelligibility for, them, for themselves. Hmm. So with that said, maybe the anti-racist pronunciation teacher can relinquish some control in the classroom by allowing students to define their own thresholds of intelligibility uh, to suit their personal context, right? So by allowing students to define their own intelligibility, uh, what they mean by intelligibility, we're actually moving away from this temptation of subscribing to different types of, you know, hegemonic manners of speaking, right? So uh, maybe students don't need to pronounce uh, decide for themselves that they don't need to pronounce the th sound in English because um, they know that in their you know personal professional lives they're not going to be talking to to people who pronounce the th in that way, right? So in in, in this sense, right, students are sort of resisting this urge to you know um, try to speak like a so-called white native speaker of English, for example. Mm. Um, another thing to think about is that um, rather than locating intelligibility in a particular voice or a particular set of phonological features, um, it's important to highlight how it's um, how intelligibility is really created relationally, right? So oral communication is always a two-way street. It's not just about what the, the speaker can do. It's also about what the listener has to do as well. So with that said, I think the pronunciation classroom really has to put an emphasis on listening. And when I talk about listening, I'm not talking about listening as some sort of neutral, um, you know, technical skill, right? I'm talking about listening as really this type of um, political practice, right? Um, it's an inherently evaluative practice, right? So when we listen to people, right, we're making different types of assumptions about them. We're enacting various types of stereotypes and so on, right? So just to repeat, listening is never neutral. On the contrary, it's very, very much political. And so recognizing the political nature of listening means that when we talk about listening practice, this always has to involve some sort of critical social linguistic study, right? So one way that we can do this is maybe to actually replicate certain types of social linguistic studies in the classroom as types of speaking, or sorry, as types of listening activities, right? So for example, why not replicate the uh, Rubin study, for example, with your students and maybe have them reflect on why they might have perceived the Asian woman as foreign sounding if they did, right? So um, through maybe critical reflection and discussion and maybe actually reading some sociolinguistic literature, for example, um, we can begin to let students, you know, begin to understand how their senses, their hearing, for example, can be, you know, conditioned by these ideologies of whiteness. And once again, well, not once again, but to just clarify, I'm not saying that you should call your students racist and say, hey, you're racist for, for, for um, perceiving the woman, for example, in Rubin's study as foreign sounding, but it's really doing it in a respectful manner and remembering that, you know, racism is not just about intent, right? So oftentimes, right, it's just how we're conditioned through our social worlds, right? And this gets reflected in our own perceptions of different types of people. Okay, so let's move on to the final priority for anti-racist pronunciation teachers. Uh, which is fighting against institutionalized racism connected with uh, speech accent. So an anti-racist pronunciation teacher, like other anti-racist educators, is not simply concerned with raising critical awareness, but also committed to fighting against the material inequalities created through linguistic white supremacy. Um, so I think this point is very important because we, we often see how speech accent gets linked to racism in various areas of our public life. Right? So depending on your 
on how you sound and right and, and in terms of racism um, these could have very real consequences in the, in the judicial system um, so you could be perceived as maybe innocent or guilty depending on how you sound um, it can affect your employment opportunities um, your access to health care you know your access to housing and so on um, so basically we have to remember that when we talk about accentism or the or discrimination on the basis of accent this is oftentimes used as a proxy for racism so we know that it's socially unacceptable to be overtly racist today. So one way that we can do so, to be racist without appearing racist is to focus on people's accents, right? But we have to really remember that even if we're focusing on people's accents, this doesn't mean that we're neglecting racism. We're still talking about racism, even if we're not you know, explicitly addressing it as such. So with that said, I think an anti-racist pronunciation teacher has to use their expertise to help change the communities in which they and their students live and work. Um, so for instance, if a local company is known to use accent to engage in racist hiring practices, you know, why not create you know, classroom projects where students can investigate and challenge these practices, right? So I know it sounds kind of idealistic and you know, you know, kind of corny and not that, uh, that well thought out, but um, we really want to think about how we can use our critical, you know, social linguistic knowledge to actually make some sort of micro level change within our communities, right? That's the least we can try to do. Um, another thing to remember activism and anti-racist pronunciation teaching is that, um, like, we really have to uh, turn inward and look at ourselves, right, as the language teaching industry, because a lot of the times our industry actually um, recreates and perpetuates racism in its various forms. Um, and one area that I'm particularly interested in and often critique on in my research, for example, is the so-called accent reduction industry, right? And oftentimes um, this industry or these accent reduction programs frame accent as this, you know, inherent problem um, that affects your, you know, employment prospects, for example, but it never really pays attention to the, you know, the structural racism that actually um, prevents us from succeeding in life, right? So um, accent reduction for immigrant professionals, for example, really neglects the fact that, you know, in order for immigrants to be employable, it's not really about changing their accents. It's really about changing institutional structures that prevent these professionals from finding work in the first place, right? So if I'm a doctor and I want to practice medicine in Canada, right, it's not really about changing my accent. It's really about getting my credentials from my home country uh, recognized right in a Canadian context. That's the bigger barrier to my, my employment rather than actually changing my accent. Okay, so to conclude, I just wanna think about um, additional priorities for an anti-racist pronunciation teacher. And I frame them as more questions that we should think about in the future. Um, so the first question is, um, how does an anti-racist pronunciation teacher fight against the intersecting forms of oppression that come along with racism, as well as racism targeted at specific groups? So when we talk about anti-racism, of course, it centers race and racism in, in its analysis, but it also recognizes that um, racism happens in conjunction with and intersects with um, other types of oppression like sexism, ableism, um, classism, homophobia, xenophobia, and so on, right? So how can we actually make our pedagogies address all of these other types of oppression in relation to accent? Um, also, we have to remember that racism affects different groups in different ways, right? So what does it mean to be an anti-racist pronunciation teacher and fight against, you know, anti-Black racism, anti-Asian racism, um, you know, anti-Indigenous racism, and so on? Um, Another question to think about is how can um, an anti-racist pronunciation teacher um, deliver instruction to the interlocutors of, who, of those who experience institutionalized racism on the basis of their accents? So when we talk about anti-racist pronunciation teaching, it's not, it shouldn't really just be for you know, the marginalized students right, in, in our classrooms. It's really about the people who have to listen to the students in our classrooms, right? the various gatekeepers in society who are going to make these racist assumptions about the students in our classroom, right? So for example, if, if we're doing action research about you know, the local racist employer in our community, right? why can't we offer our own expertise to this employer and say, hey, we can offer you some you know, pro bono training right, on help, to help you realize that you know, your hiring practices are really based on these you know, racialized assumptions of who sounds and doesn't sound right for the job, right? Mm. 
And then one final um, question is, um, how can uh, teacher training help to create anti-racist pronunciation teachers? So I know I said at the beginning of my presentation that um, there's no one right way to be an anti-racist pronunciation teacher. But having said that, I know that teacher training in general has done a terrible job at incorporating anti-racism in its um, in um, in its curricula. So um, how can like you know teacher training you know try to inspire the next generation you know of anti-racist pronunciation teachers or just language teachers in general, right? So that's some, just that's just something we should uh, think about uh, some more. Um, yeah, so I've talked way too much for now. Uh, these are just some of the references that I've used throughout my presentation. Um, if you want a copy of the slides or these re or these references, uh, feel free to email me at that email address. Um, yeah, I'm, or any, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to do, to do so, uh, to use that email address. Other than that, thank you so much for your patience. And thank you, I apologize once again uh, for taking up too much of your time at the beginning with my tech oh, issues. Please, yeah. I, yeah, no, no, no need, we thank you. Um, I, it's, I think you're exactly right um, in like what, you know, what you said about the preparation programs and all of the, th I mean, everything in context and Tyson had mentioned in the chat too, um, you know, there's, we were kind of going back and forth, like about a neutral accent. People say, you know, oh, the newscasters sound neutral or this person kind of has a neutral, but there's no such thing as neutral. Um, and I feel like even things like that still, as Stacey Margarita Johnson said in her podcast episode with you, like, do you think we're putting too much onus on the speaker instead of the listeners, like you said, to train people and to inform people how to be more sympathetic interlocutors, um, you know, as themselves, like, do you think we put too much pressure on the speaker to be intelligible instead of on listeners to listen for, you know, to listen to understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think so. Um, yeah, like once again, I think communication is the two-way street. And I think, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we put a lot of emphasis, yeah, just to repeat what I said again, is just of course. like, yeah, I think the problem once again is thinking about listening as, um, you know, this neutral pra uh, passive activity. Uh, to begin with, right? So I think people don't think that you can teach listening. <laughs> right. Um, I don't think that's something that that gets talked about a lot. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Well, and Teresa, um, who's here in Georgia with me here in the U.S., had mentioned um, they have a new, I think she said, an administrator at her school who has an English accent. And everyone's like, oh, delightful. But we know, you know, for the most part, if it weren't an English accent, or maybe if he didn't look some kind of way, I think she said it was a man. But anyway, if I'm getting that pronoun wrong, let me know. But um, that kind of that kind of perception, if it were perceived as stronger or perceived as, as you said, like unintelligible, that might be a different story. And um, I don't know, do you have any, what do we do about those things in the moment besides what we do about anything that we see as discriminatory or um, you know racist, where we call out, call in, whatever, but we address it. Do you think pronunciation um, has any different action besides saying, "Oh, you know," or, or do you have any suggestions as to how we can address that? If somebody says, "Oh, well, so and so," you know, Joe is really hard to understand because he's from wherever, but. Jim over here is so delightful from, you know, London or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is there um, any way you would suggest, or is there anything within that framework, like those three suggestions for an anti-racist pronunciation teacher to go about that? I don't know how. Mm -hmm. how we yeah. So yeah, just to, to clarify. So you mean like if someone, so you mean like if someone actually misunderstands someone, for example, and they believe it's, I, yeah. Could yeah, you just maybe. Repeat? Like, for example, I've got a couple of colleagues with very strong accents who happen to be from Asian countries. And so mm -hmm. another colleague, like Teresa said, is, you know, maybe from Scotland or Ireland or England. And it's like, oh, she's got such a nice accent. But the other colleagues who are equally intelligible, 
um, to, to, or maybe that's my perception to most people or to me are perceived as being like hard to understand. Is there any recommended path to kind of open that conversation up besides just mm -hmm. getting right in, I guess, in mm -hmm. the moment? Yeah. So I think also, um, yeah. I know, right. It's hard. Like, yeah, it is hard. Besides think, like being like, in the moment, you go, Ooh, Kelly, kind of rude. You know, like what, what do we, that's a hard conversation to have. Yeah. It, but I think also too, we also, we have to remember that oftentimes what we perceive as unintelligible isn't actually unintelligible. Cause maybe for example, <laughs> we're having a bad day. Maybe yeah. we're, you know, we're tired or we're frustrated or something like that. And, you know, uh, we hear an Asian, uh, an accent coming from an Asian person, for example, and we just think, okay, you know, it's too, too much, it's too difficult to, you know, try to put in the effort to, you know, try to understand them. So I think um, if you just like, yeah, I want to say something. Yeah, let me think more carefully. I'll have to totally, say this no, in a <laughs> 100%. So, like, I think we put too much, like, oftentimes we want to make communication like, like so fast, like we want to, we want instantaneous communication. Like mm. we want to speak very quickly, want to listen and understand very quickly. But I think like when it comes to these types of situations, we have to stop and reflect and say, you know, maybe one reason why I'm not understanding this person, it really doesn't really have to do with, you know, what they're actually saying or how they're actually saying it. It's really about my own, you know, affective states at the time, right? Once mm -hmm. again, like, am I tired? Am I angry? You know, am I frustrated about something am I stressed out um so I think it's really about slowing down and just like giving people a chance right I think also I think sometimes we're too afraid to even like ask people to just repeat themselves because oftentimes like you know sometimes I I'm not going I'm not saying that I'm like you know this saint who who automatically has every type of accent in the world but I know like I can just say apologize I, you know I'm just terrible at listening like I don't we can always frame it that way like you know i I'm a terrible listener, actually, right? I'm I, there's something that I'm not doing, right? So mm. in, my, in my part of uh, communication, so I didn't really answer your question, but no. I feel like no, but like no. I think we need to take time, just yeah, you know, process things. I know it's not like it's not something you can just change overnight. Yeah, well, and like you said, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's like that thing when somebody says something and then you ask them to clarify like two or three times, and you still don't understand it, so you just like. Mm -hmm. And you just keep going because you're like, I, I, you know, because like you said, you're not paying attention or you're hungry or it might not even be the language, but it's like the situation. So I think, yeah, I think you're right in that kind of addressing, addressing the uncomfortable part. And yeah, like, you know, is it that I'm not understanding, starting with the reflection, is it that I'm not understanding you or am I perceiving my need to understand you as like I'm going to need to try harder and I don't want to, or, you know, I can't or that kind of a thing. And I, I know you mentioned, um, I, I can't remember if it was like a tweet or the podcast. Anyway, sorry, follow your work. I'm a real creep. Um, and so, so somewhere in your body of work mentioned, um, was mentioned like student evaluations. And I think that's huge mm -hmm. because I mean, I teach at the secondary level, but, and I believe the, the reference was at the higher ed level and at the university, but um, it happens all the time in, at least in my school, where, you know, students will perceive maybe a teacher not being as pedagogically sound because they perceive them as being hard to understand. Or they say, oh, yeah, she's nice, but she's really hard to understand. I don't know if language teachers, we have a bias of like working a little, like being more of a sympathetic interlocutor, but um, I find that interesting that they'll comment on the quality or the efficacy of that person's teaching based on whether or not they actually can understand them or they think they can understand them. And I never even thought about university. Was it university evaluations? I think. Um, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I feel like it was the podcast episode, but it was like that they got on oh, okay. average, kind of like that study, like they got yeah. people commented on that or the thing you know the ratings were lower or something because they were perceived yeah. as um maybe less intelligible i need i should have put it in my notes <laughs> to myself so, but i think yeah i think i, I remember now it's about like maybe well my doctoral research was about um international teaching assistants and so right, right. there's an entire literature saying okay ita accents are 
major problems in universities because students are complaining that they can't understand mm. the TA because of you know right. the so-called foreign accent. Um, but it's interesting, once again, just like to repeat what I said earlier, like a lot of the time these student complaints about, you know, for um, international teaching assistants or international faculty um, is really about them maybe being frustrated with the course, right? So mm -hmm. like, um, like just say you're taking a difficult course, well, difficult for me, just say like, you know, physics or, or advanced, you know, calculus or something that I'm terrible at, right? I, I, I stopped math a long Same. time ago in high school. <laughs> <Same. laughs> but basically like, depending on like the subject matter, if you don't know what, if you can't grasp the, the subject matter, you're gonna use, look for scapegoats, right? And one scapegoat mm -hmm. might be your, your teacher's accent. You know, I'm not doing well in this class because my teacher is hard to understand. So um, it really goes back to this idea of that we, we we use accent too much to signify too much, right? Mm. So uh, we use accent, right, as a as a as a you know an indicator of professional competence, right? In the, in the case of teachers, right, we use it, you know, as a sign of intelligence in, in general. Um, yeah, just even like who's sexy and not sexy, right? We use it in terms of sexiness. Um, so there's we just use accent too much and I would say yeah stop relying too much on accent because it's overrated yeah right that's the quote Kelly put that in the chat <laughs> Kelly Kelly's on chat duty okay. no absolutely <laughs> like yeah <laughs> and Noreen's like French accent French ass French accent is the sexiest no that's true and I think um not the sexy part I think that's true I think but also very sexy accent uh in France but no, like, I think you're, yeah, I think you're exactly right. And class, a couple of people, a couple of people had mentioned um, up earlier that, you know, it also in the US and, and many other places, but I think their reference was the US, that it also signifies, you know, class to a degree because you know, you've got so many variations. And for example, you know, what do people in the US what do people do when they're trying to sound, um, ignorant or less intelligent or whatever they sound southern like that's what people do you know and yeah. um if they're trying to sound tough they sound like they're from new york city or new jersey and they say things like forget about it you know and all that kind of thing um if they're trying to sound salt of the earth they try to sound midwestern you know and and it's it's really interesting to see or california right like surfer we have all of these like different kind of stereotypes but I think you're right that I or not. I think you're right. Obviously, you're right. I agree that it's it's an interesting concept that they're attached to our senses because we completely get like we just get enveloped in people's mm -hmm. accent sometimes. And I think for me, you're really making me reflect on how I react to accents and how I'm, as Teresa said, how I'm finding them delightful or when you lean in a little bit further because you're like trying really hard to understand it. I would hope is as language people, we do a little bit better of a job at that than the average uh, person. But um, I don't know. I, I, it, it's just really complicated. And as language teachers, I know some people in the chat mentioned, um, you know, they get asked what kind of Spanish they teach or, you know, what kind of French do you teach? What kind, what accent, what, what vocabulary are we learning here? Um, and that's, that's really interesting as well. Dr. LJ Randolph, last week or the week before mentioned that he kind of refers to it as institutionalized language. Like when you're learning from, you know, somebody who's like trying to make language as umbrella or as neutral as possible, but you can't really do that. So um, just an interesting concept. I had one more question for you, if that's okay. If you have a minute. Sure. Yay. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah. My, my question was, um, are we idealizing and, and I forgot what part of the podcast that I had jotted this down to myself, but I think it was at the beginning because it's at the beginning of my notes. So we'll go that it's chronological. Um, are we, do you think that we're idealizing um, in, in the racist tendencies that you mentioned regarding accents? Is the underlying message that we're idealizing monolingualism in a lot of ways and not multilingualism? Like, do you think it goes beyond accent to actually command of languages? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, like when we talk, like I know there's there's been past presentations on you know translanguaging and just languaging in general. And so we have to remember that languaging also means you know 
um, I don't know, what's like accenting <laughs> for yeah. lack of a better term, right? So like pronunciation and accent is really the small stuff of language, right? So mm -hmm. when we're talking about one way to, to sound like, right, for example, in the pronunciation classroom, yeah, that's another, yeah, I completely agree with you, Meredith. Like it's really about, you know, another way to reinforce monolingualism and this idea of a so-called standard accent or, you know, this, um, you know, native speaker accent. So I think, um, right, to really get past this, right, we, we want to think about like translanguaging on the micro level, right, in terms mm -hmm. of using all of our research, our linguistic repertoire in terms of the phonemes at our disposal, right? So for example, I can pronounce the number three as three, but you know, my parents are from Trinidad, for example, and they say the number three as tree. <laughs> and so, you know, I can, I understand what they say. I can say tree, I can say hi, um, it's, you know, it's, um, yeah, what is it, March? March is the third month of the year, right? If I said March is the third month, well, I know, well, that's sort of funny term, but anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> Third, I wasn't going to say that. You know, you know, I mean, the, like the ordinal, you know. What is totally. It? Uh, well, listen, yeah. March 2020 was kind of a turd month of the year. So, yeah. like, Okay, fair. it works. Okay. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that yeah. makes sense. Well, I think there's, and Marcus mentioned too in the chat, um, that, you know, we're, we're clearly definitely in favor of monolingualism here in the U.S., but um, I think we also need to recognize in a lot of ways the shame that gets wrapped up in language and pronunciation and accent and multilingualism um, because you know you have people like Noreen mentioned in the chat her dad gets quiet he's from Pakistan he gets quiet around white people because he's like you know might feel like he's not like speaking the language well even though his English is fine um, and intelligible I'm sure to most people she didn't say that but you know it's like please um, and, and, and they can function because, you know, people are functioning. Is there any research out there? And I promise I'll let you go. Uh, is there any research out there that we can, or do you know of any literature that looks into any of that, like shame when it comes to pronunciation or accent or that kind of that social, emotional, experiential piece? Yeah. So I think, well, there's definitely literature on linguistic insecurity. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'll just plug my own research. Why not? <laughs> um, yes. So I did. Yeah. So my PhD thesis was about um, international teaching assistance, like I mentioned. And so uh, like one finding or one recurring finding from that research was really about like how the ITAs really felt uncomfortable talking with you know these white native speakers of English, mm. um, both students and you know colleagues and and faculty, right? Just basically all white native speakers of English. And as a result, they felt more pressure to actually change their accent, right? Their professional practices um, revolved around making themselves sound, you know, whiter or sound more native, mm. right? Um, but when they were, you know, with around, you know, fellow international students or people of the same ethno-racial and linguistic background, they felt like they could just be themselves, you know, in terms of their right. accent, right? So um, yeah, there is definitely literature yeah, beyond mine, but I'm just plugging mine just for the sake of That's all we care about. We don't care um, about anybody else. <laughs> yeah, so there's definitely yeah, literature on that. So yeah, there is a, a psychological dimension to all of this, but we have to remember that the psychological dimension is still, you know, very much sociological, right? So we don't yeah. have these insecurities. We don't get these insecurities, you know, out of nowhere, right? They don't, we just don't randomly develop them, right? They're a product of our, you know, our social, sociocultural, um, environments, right? Mm -hmm. So like I mentioned in my land acknowledgement, right? So when we think about our whole perceptions of accents, right? These are due to socio-historical forces, right? This is not something that we just came up with one day. Right. Like we made the rules, so let's break them because they're not, yeah. they're not real. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Kelly mentioned in the chat too, and I know it's come up in um, previous webinars, but just that concept too of you know, white students being in, for example, like a dual language immersion program. And it's like, oh, cute, you know, little so-and-so can speak, you know, is learning Mandarin, that's so sweet. But when it's a multilingual person from China speaking Mandarin and then doing English, it can be perceived, you know, differently. Or when it's, you know, a black and brown person doing that, it's perceived as differently. It's like one person gets kind of lifted for their bi or multilingualism and another person is seen as a deficit, which um, I think is something that we as language teachers need to continue to combat and you know work towards. But 
I think, as you said in the, again, somewhere in a tweet or in a podcast or something, um, I, you know, the process, right? It's gotta be, it's gotta be a process just like any, any other anti-racist practices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's not something that you can just, you know, do overnight. I know there is an urgency, right, to anti-racism. Mm-hmm. Like we are living like in this white supremacist world, but we also need, you know, we can't just, to be realistic, like we need time to actually, you know, we can't just rush in and do do something, right? We have to have some sort of plan. Right. Just have, yeah. And, and, you know, be flexible at the same time, but at least like think about it before you, you know, jump in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, VJ. We, I, I can't, I say we, but I'm just, just sitting here in my weird green screen pod. Um, <laughs> we, the Royal We, uh, appreciate your time and your effort. And we, we would have waited for <laughs> however long you would have needed because you've really, you've given us a lot to think about. And I'm so grateful for your time and your energy and your resources and all the things and just all you do. So I'm going to keep creeping on Twitter and all the places if you don't mind. <laughs> And um, yeah, we thank you so much. I'm gonna post, if it's okay, I'll post the recording to the playlist. And of course. Um, awesome, is there any other, like uh, you shared your email address, which was great. Would it be possible um, to put that in the chat maybe, or just sort of re-share yeah. if that's okay? If people wanna get in touch yeah. with you. Yeah, I'm so like today I'm so angry because I was already like with my video and camera, uh, like I had to move my webcam. So I don't have like a good angle to show my face now. <laughs> like, like, so, sorry for not having my, my video on. <laughs> That's okay. But, um, Please, it's okay. You've got the weird angle of the camera and I'm just a floating head and hands. So it's <laughs> fine. We're, we're a great pair. <laughs> I want you to see my nostrils for <laughs> 30 minutes. Here for your nostrils specifically. No, I, I completely understand. I was, yeah, it's, yeah, a year ago, we might not have, we might not have been able to relate. Now we've all been teaching like computer school for 11 months and we've got like, boop, 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 like everything looks like NASA. So yeah, if any, if anybody doesn't understand, I don't know what rock they're living under. <laughs> Yay. Oh, perfect. Okay. So his That's email, great. awesome, is in the chat. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. And everybody who's attending, thank you for attending. We've actually got three this week. Um, if you're interested, uh, I've got, hold on, let me, boop, there's a link in the chat. Um, language teacher or not, if you're in wherever you are located currently, um, tomorrow is going to be kind of a look back at technology over the last um, 20, 25 years, but specifically in language learning and language teaching. And then Thursday will be a look at authentic resources in different ways to incorporate them in virtual or hybrid environments or whatever it is we're doing these days. I don't know, I'm taking it one day at a time. So <laughs> that's, maybe that's me, but thank you so much for your time. And um, we really appreciate